Right now, 50% of the world is offline. Bridging the digital divide can create jobs, bring informal businesses into the formal market, and increase market access, particularly for vulnerable groups such as women and youth. How do we unlock the potential of young digital entrepreneurs to better navigate the current health and economic crisis? Join a new generation of game changers to find out. So welcome to UNCTAD session at the UN SDG Action Zone. For the next 45 minutes, we are going to talk about bridging the digital divide and leaving no one behind. I am Elena Deek, UNCTAD Youth Network and coordinator of the Youth Action Hub in the Sultanate of Oman. With us today, we have an amazing set of panelists with us. And let me start by introducing three digital entrepreneurs, or let me just actually call them game changers, who are actually shaping the world the way we want, one digital step at a time. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Nancy Amunga, e-founder, e-trade for women, founder and CEO of Dana Logistics Kenya. Mr. Magellan Fetalino, e-founder, founder and CEO of Accident Technologies Inc. in the Philippines. And Ms. Ujo Ozo Ojinaka, e-founder, founder and CEO of Traders for Africa, Nigeria. Welcome. We also have with us two innovators, two innovators who have worked together on a mindset changing program to make sure that what is needed for young generation of digital entrepreneurs is present, especially in a world where we leave no one behind. Please join me again in welcoming Brian Wong, founder of Alibaba Global Initiatives at Alibaba Group, and advisor of the eFounder Fellowship Program. Welcome, Brian. And Ms. Arlette Verplog, Chief of Communications and External Relations and Manager of the eFounder Fellowship, UNCTAD. Welcome, Arlette. It's really wonderful that all of us here are kind of like already quite global in that sense, right? We're all tuning in from different parts of the world to connect and talk about this bridge that has been created through the digital divide. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to uh, kind of tell our global viewers who are out there listening to us right now that you can connect to this online conversation through Twitter using two hashtags. One is hashtag SDG Action Zone and the second one is hashtag Emerging Tech. You could also contact us on communication at unctad.org. Now getting into the conversation, I have said the word digital quite a number of times right now. Arlet, we have heard over the past couple of months due to COVID-19, we keep hearing these phrases, digital era, digital age, digital technology. Why is digital so important? Well, thanks, Elena. Yes, and good day to everybody from Geneva, UNCTAD. And I'm so happy to be part of this session with Bright Entrepreneurs and with Brian Wong, with whom I co-managed uh, the eFounders Fellowship Initiative uh, that empowers digital entrepreneurs from developing countries. So digital technologies, can we actually today imagine a world without smartphones, without devices? Uh, digital technology has become so much part of our life as an enabler, a connector, and there's so many opportunities that it presents. Now, of course, with COVID-19, uh, we can see that there has been actually more or less like an implosion of explosion of the use of digital technologies. And when we use the word social distancing, what do we hear? Uh, teleworking, teleconferencing, uh, telemedicine, remote socializing, e-entertainment, and of course the whole schooling system, uh, online learning. And this is just the beginning. Now that we've all seen how these technologies can help in our daily life, how is this going to be post COVID? Likely this trend will continue. That is so true. And you know, you, you touched upon a very important point um, saying that digitization helps in our daily lives. 
But, you know, I was reading a report um, a couple of days ago. Um, it's the Digital Cooperation Report, which was launched last year. And it stated that uh, a little more than 50%, to be precise, 53.6% of the world's population is using internet now, which means what? Which means that there's almost close to about 3.6 billion people without access of the internet. So when it comes to this digital divide, it is growing, isn't it? And there has to be a downside. Yes, there's a downside. And as you mentioned it already, there's this gap between the connected and those that are not connected. So right, half of the world's population, only half of it is connected to the internet. Uh, if you look at women, less than 50% of the women are connected. And then least developed countries, only one out of five people is connected. So what does this mean? A divide. And this divide, unfortunately, even now with COVID, is only growing. But that's not the only downside that exists. Um, if we look, for example, at market shares of platforms, uh, the big ones are all located or operated from the US and China. And they have now comparative advantages when you look at networking effects, and the connection, uh, the collection and analysis of data, so-called digital intelligence. And I hope that the entrepreneurs here in this session will talk a little bit more about how important data is and is it indeed the commodity of the century, as one recalls. Um, then another downside is if we look at the privacy data uh, rules. Now with COVID, of course, there's a sort of a trade-off, even if countries have already set up regulation for data protection and those that have not, we're looking at um, health, public health requirements. And this puts, of course, private data a bit behind. Is this a trend that will follow or not? These are just some of the big downsides of a, the digital uh, technologies. That's, that's really interesting. And it actually reminds me of a, uh of a quote that our UN chief mentioned. He says, you know, the, the longer we wait to address this gap, it's the further we are going to fall behind when it comes to digitization. Um, according to you, so there has to be some kind of an ecosystem created that act, acts as a conducive environment for young entrepreneurs to flourish in. What would you say are these elements that we are looking at in terms of creating that perfect ecosystem? So the word ecosystem is very important because digital technologies are inclusive. It's not the digital technologies that create these divides, it's having access to it. And as I just mentioned already, there are many countries, many parts of the world where countries are not digitally ready. Transition to the digital economy is difficult. And this now, as I also said earlier on, uh, only creates additional divides. So for me, as we're talking as, as an SDG uh, session, SDG 17 on partnerships, it's really important. Governments, uh, businesses, communities, all should step together uh, to overcome already COVID-19, but also to deal with this digital divide that needs to be tackled now, straight away. We can't work uh, wait until tomorrow. And to help these digital game changers, uh, to enable them to set up or help setting up a digital economy. So actually, what can we do? There's several things. Uh, access. So we're talking about broadband connectivity. It's important, especially in rural areas, that investments are made by governments and supporting uh, funding partners to set up an affordable and good quality broadband connection. Then if we also look at rules uh, at national level, there should be uh, rules making that uh, embrace digital economies. Now, technologies move so quickly that even for governments, sometimes it's difficult to keep abreast of what's happening. Um, right. but every country has so many pioneers, the game changers. So why not inviting them to the table? Uh, start consultation processes between governments and businesses. And for example, almost every country has a national trade facilitation committee. This would be, for example, a good avenue where you could have public and private sector meet together. If we look at investment here as well, it's really important. In developing countries, investors and VCs try to go towards um, real estate, agriculture, 
and uh, digital uh, technologies are put a bit on a side burner. Uh, governments could create incentives so that investors also look at this and governments could try to see how can we create a system where uh, all these entrepreneurs can really flourish with tech schemes and others that can help them grow. Finally, a last point is education and networking. It's really important for all these businesses, and I hope the entrepreneurs will touch upon this as well, to network, to exchange experience, uh, to partner, to set up this ecosystem together. And then for governments and businesses together to gain the trust of consumers to see how this can move forward, uh, security and so on. So again, SDG 17 partnerships. That is wonderful. And, you know, I, I really liked the, the point that you brought up about having game changers brought to the table. And as part of our discussion, I'd like to bring uh, an amazing game changer, Nancy, uh, into the conversation as well. You know, um, Nancy, Arla just mentioned about um, transformation into the digital era kind of becoming difficult. And it is a challenge uh, no matter where you are. You are the founder and CEO of Dana Logistics. So when it comes to your business, um, how has it basically coped with the current situation? How, how has it helped that your business is digital during this COVID-19 period? Um, thank you so much, Elena. It's such a pleasure to be here. So during this pandemic, it helped that our business had an online presence because we could still access our clients online. And uh, we also diversified our services to target and focus more on essential products providers, such as the pharmacies and the supermarket businesses. We could not focus on restaurants because they were closed at this time. And besides uh, more people resorted to you know, cook at home, um, as we understand more people are still trying to save on cost. And, um, because we understand this uh, pandemic had a lot of negative impact on most people. And then as food customer traffic dropped for most small traders and businesses who depend on working customers because of social distance and people being advised to stay at home, Dana as an e-commerce logistics provider continued to fill the gap by taking the opportunity to act as a link between the buyers and the sellers because uh, people could still stay at home and then uh, buy from whatever it is that they were buying from and then we would still take it to them. So I think we played a very big role in um, furthering the social distance agenda. And then during this time also, we've been developing different strategies to create more trust between the buyers and the sellers by making sure we deliver on time. And uh, I want to acknowledge that without trust, the e-commerce industry cannot thrive. So we believe that trust is everything. And uh, that's what we've been working on, like just building the trust between the buyers and the sellers. Because at times these people don't see each other. So as a logistics company and as a delivery company, we've been coming in between and trying to build the trust between them. Thank you. That is really, really wonderful that you spoke about building trust uh, because it is very, very true that even though we are in the COVID situation where businesses tend to face these kind of challenges, you have kind of taken it upon yourself to build tr trust and create a stronger relationship between customers and your business. Um, what would you say would be the biggest change that your business had to face? Um, so we really had to work hard on our marketing strategy, like I mentioned earlier, because more people were online, yes, but more businesses were also um, were all, also went online. So how exactly do we stand out? So we really had to, you know, like work so hard on that. And at some point, we even had to, you know, um, seek experts' advice and even outsource. So I'd say that's one of the major things that we've been working on during this time. That is wonderful. And, you know, um, I'd like to get uh, Ujo into the conversation as well. Ujo, Nancy mentioned that, you know, when it comes to online marketplace, uh, she had to make a couple of changes with regard to Dana Logistics, her business. Um, you also uh, do 
work in the same kind of environment, which is online marketing, where you focus on uh, funding and investing African trade, especially in the pan-African business area. So my question, I guess, to you would be, how in your experience did you really keep or maintain a pan-African business alive, given that we are currently in a pandemic? Oh, thank you so much, Alena. And thank you for hosting this. Um, Traders of Africa, Tofa, is a Pan-African online marketplace for products grown, produced, and manufactured in Africa only. We don't keep content. We are strictly a point of convergence. In order to solve the problem of trust and payment times, which Nancy mentioned earlier, uh, we had to create a Source Pro unit, which is like an offline part of the business, as where, where we became buyers to sellers and sellers to buyers, and created a Pan African digital platform for funding and investing in African trade, where genuine suppliers of African products with confirmed orders backed by an acceptable payment terms could go to the platform and request for funding. And those funding requests are broken down into units and offered to individuals, companies, groups all over the world to invest in and earn a share of the profit. So what it means is that you can be anywhere in the world and still participate in African trade. Now, this was very difficult to do during the lockdown, so to say, because even though part of what we do is, to, uh, is uh, distribution of food products like different kinds of ag agro commodities, because of the lockdown, the border closures, the restrictions that were put in the various ports, it was difficult. So you see very motivated suppliers, you see right. also, you see also buyers who were very interested in getting this product, but the supply chain was quite disrupted. So it was very difficult because prior to then, it was very easy for us, for a food agent to hop in into a flight and move to the particular country right. where we need to move from. But because of the lockdown, it was quite difficult to do. So right. what we did at that point was to create what we call TOFA partnerships. This was one of the learnings we got from our training at the eFounders pro, um, program, all right? So we, we started to offer partnerships in about 10 African countries with confirmed aggregators, people who were already on the platform anyway. So what we do with them is that those orders that we have from their various countries, we, they help us to aggregate, they help us to do the whole process. So we don't need to send someone from from any other place to go and supervise those um, transactions. Because you know that in everything we do, we must ensure that quality and specification according to what the buyer requires must be met. So that, that, that is was wonderful. one of the things. Yeah. That is really, really uh, wonderful. Um, and you know, you, you mentioned a very important points about, you know, borders being closed and then you still managed to kind of create um, convergence in terms of carrying on the business despite the pandemic. And I'd like to get uh, Brian into the conversation at this point. Um, Brian, you know, it is, it is very important. And, you know, as, as Jack Ma says, you know, we have to start now, start small, think big. It's important to start now with the given resources we have, the skill set we have. Um, what role do you see young digital entrepreneurs playing in the world today? And especially with the, the challenges we're facing? Thank you, Elena, for this opportunity and always uh, very happy to be with our eFounder fellows and, and our led, our, our very uh, key partner in this, uh, uh, this community. Um, you know, we're facing a very challenging time, both politically, economically, and socially with the disruptions uh, that are impacting the entire world. And you ask, what's the role of the young digital entrepreneurs? Um, and my answer is really that uh, it is these young people who actually are going to be the ones that help uh, the world come up with the most innovative uh, and, um, you know, revolutionary solutions to the problems we're facing. Clearly, the traditional and the old way of doing things like uh, business um, and, and managing many of the things that affect us day in and day out has had its um, problems. And it's really up to us now 
uh, as a community, but particularly with new and fresh ideas from the, from the young generation to think about how to seize this moment in time when technology is now emerging. Uh, you said 50% of the world ha only has connectivity today, but that's a lot right. better than um, you know, 10, 15 years ago when it was a much smaller uh, proportion of the world. Um, and this number will only grow. But the question is, how do you leverage the technology? Number one, to ensure that all people are part of the formal economy, the, the, um, the mainstream sort of society in terms of how we uh, do things, uh, whether it's in day-to-day -day commerce, whether it's in healthcare, whether it's in communications. Um, and, and then how do we uh, bring the rest of the uh, global community along? And at the same time, then how do we address issues like climate change? How do we address issues like inequality? How do we address things like um, the lack of understanding between uh, you know, communities, countries, uh, cultures? All of that will, um, you know, I think technology can have a profound impact on how that's done. And Arlette mentioned that you know, it's not this technology sort of revolution or what some call the fourth industrial revolution is not without its challenges. But I also believe that we, um, as a community, and particularly with young people thinking about these issues, um, can also help come up with new solutions. And so many call this era now that we're facing, not the COVID era, but the Great Reset. And it's now incumbent upon all of us to reset things, but incorporate the technology that we have now at our fingertips that Uju's talked about, that Nancy's talked about, that Magellan, is doing in the Philippines and beyond, and come together as a community and work together, and that's why you know Alibaba and UNCTAD are so critical. Uh, in 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 well, that's why we've come together to create something like this to empower the youth, uh, but leverage business, technology, and the public sector. Get involved, uh, governments and um, multilateral organizations, because all of us have to work together to address this issue. Absolutely. And, you know, talking about bringing global communities together, I'd like to also remind our, our global uh, audience who are watching us right now, you could definitely get a part uh, of this conversation and join in on Twitter by using two hashtags, hashtag SDG Action Zone and hashtag Emerging Tech. You could also contact us on communication at ongtad.org. Now, Brian, I really like the idea of the great reset. It definitely seems like something that is needed. Um, you know, we have all, we have heard about uh, different types of uh, phrases, such as the blue economy, the green economy, uh, and we all know what the traditional economy is. I would like a little more understanding of what is the difference between the digital economy and the traditional. Well, I think the main difference is really this concept of a zero sum game. I think in the traditional economy, the, the, the assumption was, uh, you know, you, you win, I lose, uh, and that there could be no sort of sharing in the prosperity. It, it really was kind of, you know, one versus the other. The main difference today is in the digital economy, there's something uh, called data. And as Arlette mentioned, it's the most valuable commodity now in the, in the sort of digital economy. But the main difference between data and say a traditional economy resource like oil, for example, is that data is a renewable resource. Uh, it doesn't get used up. In fact, the more you use data, the more new data you produce. The other thing is that data is non-rivalous, which means that when you use it, it doesn't get you, uh, it, it, it does, it, when you're using it, others can use it at the same time and it can be yeah. shared. And so the idea is that the network effect, actually bringing more partners into the network, into a, onto a platform, will actually create more prosperity for everyone uh, that's involved. And so it becomes a, um, it really uh, is no longer a zero sum game. And uh, it's really about growing the pie as opposed to fighting over a limited pie. And I think that's what all of the e-founders sort of share as a common sort of belief is that by working together, by sharing the data uh, with one another to create more prosperity, uh, that you can create this abundance and opportunity um, through partnership and this network effect. 
That is correct. And, you know, we have these amazing um, entrepreneurs with us today that are doing amazing in their own fields. But when it comes to um, entrepreneurs who are, you know, placed in different countries, not every country, like, like, like we're talking about, has access to internet or has the privilege to get mentors um, or can actually go through the same process to become a success. So according to you, what are the key elements for any successful entrepreneur, irregardless of like where they are? Well, our fellows will be very familiar th with this when I say, First and foremost, an entrepreneur, a uh, successful one, must have a strong sense of mission, vision, and values. And what does that mean? I think entrepreneurs really need to think about their purpose and why they are creating their ventures. Uh, what is the social problem that they're trying to solve? Uh, and you know, what, uh, what does that look like in terms of more sort of concrete targets through your vision and their values? How does that define sort of what you believe as an organization? That I think is first and foremost, the most fundamental um, you know, uh, key success element in any entrepreneur. Um, but second is really collaboration. And how do you work with uh, those um, you know, partners in your own community, in your marketplace, and even beyond? And uh, each one of the entrepreneurs we have today on this, um, this discussion and in the larger eFounder Fellowship community has done just that. They've worked with uh, other fellows within their marketplaces, but even across borders within, say, the continent of Africa or within Asia and between Asia and Africa. And I think that's a very powerful start to what I think is a very important feature of uh, successful entrepreneurs in this era, era is collaboration. And finally, I would say empowerment. Think about the, the business or the platform that you're building and how that empowers others, not just yourself. So one of the things that, you know, successful entrepreneurs are going to have as a feature is leveraging their technology uh, to help others uh, and empower those others who are users of your platform. And that again is a feature of our eFounder fellows. They are all building platforms to empower others in their community and make their businesses successful. And by doing that, you yourself as a business become successful. Very interesting. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to get uh, um, Magellan in, into the conversation at this point. Um, you are the CEO of um, Akiden Technologies, which is actually one of the top 10 fastest growing fintechs in the Philippines. Congratulations, first of all. It's, it, this is definitely a, a feather in your hat. Um, when we talk about about, you know, as, as Brian spoke about, we spoke about, you know, having a very good foundation and building from there. Uh, where do you think does Accident Technologies help with the now, the next, and most importantly, futures um, in terms of the SMEs? Thank you, Alina. Um, I think uh, how we were able to position ourselves as a digital platform uh, to help a lot of small businesses get access to financing before the lockdown uh, and before this the, the, the crisis caused by COVID um, made us like an important voice, especially for uh, the policymaking uh, entities uh, to promote uh, inclusivity here in the country. Um, as an example, um, I think because of our presence and our existence, a lot of uh, the banks who would normally not consider or look into digital transformation uh, that seriously before, uh, all of a sudden started approaching us and talking to us on how to like help them uh, provide uh, the same access that we are providing to SMEs to their own clients. Um, so I think being, we, uh, it's good that we became a good ro role model for a lot of these uh, large institutions because at the end of the day, uh, as mentioned by everybody, uh, Brian uh, and Arlette, collaboration is key. Um, a lot of these banks look at financial technology platforms as competitors before, but now we're all collaborators and uh, we, and with the data that we have, I think uh, the thing about data is you're able to understand uh, the need of the market better. So uh, by sharing the data that we have with 
all of the ecosystem players, uh, it's really uh, benefiting everyone uh, uh, here, in, here, here in the country uh, in terms of inclusivity. That is really great. And, you know, like picking up on the point of being inclusive, uh, not every MSME or SME is fortunate enough, especially, you know, in, in countries that are developing or least developed to kind of gain support of fintech digital investors or sponsors. Like what would you have as an advice to them? Or what do you think is the way that, you know, you can navigate through such a situation? One interesting data here in the Philippines since the lockdown, in terms of like uh, Filipinos having access to digital bank accounts, um, it increased by 2,000% uh, month on month in the last few months. And I think what drove this is um, that a lot of these large institutions started to really like deploy resources together with the aid of govern, uh, the government uh, to bring all of these unbanked uh, people into uh, the formal uh, economy. Um, so because of the shared resources but from the government and the private sector, the, in, the, 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 the timeline to inclusivity has actually hastened. So right. uh, COVID really became like a, a catalyst for digital transformation and inclusivity for uh, a lot of people here. That is great because, you know, when we talk about bridging the digital divide, we're talking about it, you know, adding jobs to the market. We talk about informal businesses, like you, like, like you mentioned, uh, entering into formal markets. We talk about market access um, that also can be increased in terms of, you know, the vulnerable groups, um, youth, women, things like that. And I'd like to now, you know, open, open the discussion among um, all the panelists that are here today about, you know, how can we overcome this digital divide and actually create a world where we leave no one behind. Um, I'd like to start, uh, you know, by um, getting Ujo into the into the picture where you you spoke about having challenges and how you overcame them. Bravo for you to do that. That's really amazing. Um, so what I get from that is you really see the necessity for strong partnerships and you know a, a digital presence for businesses. Am I right? Very right. I mean, um, digital presence, whether by having your online website or any of the social media platforms, you know, the necessity, especially now with the pandemic, has thrown it open that every business should just be online, okay, because it gives you visibility. You're just out there. It expands your reach. Anybody from anywhere in the world, you just go to the internet and they'll find your business. Okay, and also in terms of partnerships, it, it's, it reduces your cost of acquisition. It leads to incremental business, okay? And it helps you out, it gives you the kind of resources. You're able to access resources you need to grow your venture. And people are out there to help. Truth of the matter is that during the pandemic, when I had some of our BLs held by UPS in Dubai, I reached out to my contacts on LinkedIn, and within 24 hours, people in Dubai literally went to the office, UPS office in Dubai, and got them to ship our documents that same day. Okay, and that's what having partnerships will do for us. That is really, really good. Um, and that's wonderful to also keep in mind for entrepreneurs to like look at different ways of creating networks and always branch out and share access. Knowledge is key. Um, technology is a tool. So I'd, I'd like to get again, uh, Magellan into the, into the discussion where, you know, we talk about, um, Ujo spoke about actually businesses being open 24 seven, but in order for a business to actually be open 24 seven, you should have some kind of a solution that you're focusing on in terms of localization or your region in specific, because you know what they say, it's first people action and then local action and then global action. So when it comes to actual regionalization or um, localization for digital entrepreneurs what do you have to say when it comes to these entrepreneurs and setting up their businesses um, so you are correct because um, right now I think in the marketplace uh, and perhaps because of the very high unemployment rate all of a sudden 
there is this new breed of entrepreneurs in the market. Uh, in the Philippines, 50% of our adult, adult population lost their jobs uh, in the last few months. And but, I, but the good thing about that is uh, it created a lot of entrepreneurs, it created a lot of new businessmen. Um, and I think in, in setting yourself apart from everybody else, it's very important to um, do something that uh, you understand. Uh, as mentioned by Brian, uh, a good entrepreneur is mission, vision driven. Um, so a sl you, you have to make sure that in, uh, in, in whatever project you, uh, you get into, uh, it, it's important that you're doing something that you like, you understand, you're passionate about. Uh, and because I think one thing that uh, in, in this digital space, uh, in this digital um, world that we live in, uh, people can easily see whether you're genuine uh, about the products you sell, uh, genuine in a, in a way that you understand what you're selling. So I think that's what uh, would set up uh, a good entrepreneur uh, apart in this like massive global marketplace. That is really great. Um, and it actually brings me to a point uh, where maybe Nancy could come in. Um, Nancy, you know, like uh, Magellan just now said that when you have your vision and your mission, and, and Brian stated that as well, you are almost sure to succeed in terms of creating a solid foundation. But what happens if you have, you know, uh, an e-commerce site and you are faced with the challenges of big giants such as Amazon, Alibaba, eBay. What do you do then? Um, first of all, I want to appreciate the fact that the cake is big and I think uh, there's space for everyone. So you just need to cut your slice and uh, you know understand what you want to do with that slice. Don't be afraid of the big, you know, the big giants. Um, I always say the, the the lion is the is the king of the jungle, but we can all cohabit and see how to live together. And as I stated earlier, I think trust is very important for you to stand out. You really need to build that uh, um, to build the trust with your customers. This also enables you to retain the client for the long run. So make sure you build and maintain the relationship with your customers. Um, and you can only do this when trust is intact. And then um, choose what to sell. You cannot sell everything. So it's important to know what products you want to sell. And also depending on the area that you're in or the area that you're targeting, you need to know the laws so that you can sell, you know, like legal stuff. And then get personal. It's very important to know your customers and what they like and uh, make it about experience. And on this note, also make sure your site is easy to na navigate so that your clients have an easy time shopping, all right? And um, make the return policy clear. I know this is one, one area where the buyers and the sellers have a rift, where you buy something and you're like, this is not what I saw, or this is, it does not feel right. So just make it clear before the buyer buys so that they have options, they know what their options are. And then of course, choose a reliable delivery partner. In short, I'm saying if you're here, choose us, choose Dana. Um, because you want the product to reach to the clients in one piece and also on time. And I always say, if you feel like you're very overwhelmed, feel free to engage an expert and also feel free just to, you know, outsource and talk to different people on how you can go about this. But still, I believe the cake is big. Do not be afraid about the giants like Alibaba. I know Brian is here. So just pick your slice and, you know, know figure out what to do with it. Thank you, Nancy. I think you've got us all really hungry now. Uh, talking about cake and we all are definitely part of a very big cake that has 17 parts of it the 17 sdgs um and brian let's let's get you uh in on this and of course i cannot offer you a slice of cake right now but maybe you could offer us some advice when it comes to this 
So all the um, entrepreneurs here on our panel have basically spoken about something that has been reoccurring during the conversations about building partnerships, about having a great networks. I'd like to ask you when it comes to the public private partnerships and you know, as um, Arlet mentioned as well, the SDG 17 on partnerships, um, where do you think that fits in? What is the role of the public private partnerships for a young digital entrepreneur? Uh, thank you for asking that question, Elena. I think that um, the public private partnership is probably more important than any other time today because the problems that we're confronting now are no longer uh, local problems. Um, they're not just national problems, they're global problems. And some of the challenges we talked about, connectivity, for example, infrastructure, that falls under the responsibility of the public sector. And at the same time, the public sector needs input from the private sector to really understand what are the customer needs, what are the, um, the tools that the entrepreneurs themselves require to enable them to actually build on top of that infrastructure. Uh, and by working together in the public-private uh, sort of uh, partnership, uh, you know, the, the end goal is really to create a system, an ecosystem, so to speak, both locally and internationally that enables the participants in that economy and that society to fulfill their objectives and to create um, you know, commerce and to provide services to the people of that community. And so both sides need to play a part, but they need to communicate, they need to collaborate and they need to align um, sort of their, uh, their uh, efforts. And so I think we've seen a few good case uh, studies of that in places like China, in places um, like, uh, you know, Southeast Asia and increasingly in Africa, I know many of the governments, such as in Rwanda, in Ethiopia, Botswana, Kenya, um, these countries, the governments are committed to transforming the economies into digital economies. And frankly speaking, these countries also have an advantage over the developed countries, which is they have very little in the way of legacy uh, systems or infrastructure. So they can actually leapfrog ahead straight into the digital economy. But the governments, once they uh, start to invest in this infrastructure, they actually need entrepreneurs to help build the applications on top of that infrastructure. And so um, the entrepreneurs also need some, some space, a sandbox, so to speak, to experiment and to try things. And the government needs to give them that space. And so this is really a dynamic interaction, which ultimately should uh, enable uh, these um, you know, countries to create the, the digital ecosystems that they need to solve their specific problems and then ultimately connect to the larger global community uh, and then uh, allow for commerce to happen, not just locally, but also internationally. That is great, you know, uh, and I, I think that actually takes me to like Arlet and I have a question uh, for you. Um, Arlet, you know, when we talk about the agenda 2030 and we, we are right at the tip of the start, the dawn of the decade of delivery. And when Brian spoke about so many countries that are actually moving forward in terms of, you know, um, working towards the attainability of Agenda 2030, and we talk about um, the entire decade where you are going to work towards it. When it comes to actually delivering uh, or ensuring digital inclusivity for all different sectors, um, you know, like uh, like the, the ones that are, um, hits by COVID, like the tourism sector, for example, or um, the informal sectors, for example. Uh, how do you see that actually uh, putting, putting up with this entire digital divide that we're talking about? Yeah, so it's true. Digital technologies, again, they're not the ones who create the divide. Actually, they can be the, the, the uh, solving the problem, uh, the response to it. Uh, digital technologies are inclusive. So if you look at the informal sector where often people do not have any visibility, actually they are hardly part of society, and you start uh, involving them through digital technology, and one can think of, for example, fishermen who usually go to the market 
and sell their fish there. Now with COVID, there is no market. Uh, right. So for example, in South Africa, there is a platform that offers space for these uh, informal fishermen to sell their products uh, to consumers directly. So they become visible. Um, another example is where street vendors used to sell uh, products. Now, if you give them access to, uh, even if it's on social media, where they can sell products, they, there is a trace of money, products and money. So banks start seeing that these people work, they have an income, they generate income. So if they want a loan, they're able to have access to loans. It's exactly what Majinan said that COVID-19 actually accelerated some parts of, of society that are marginalized to be pulled back into former sectors. Now, also, if we look at tourism, yes, tourism, whole hospitality sector, it's incredibly uh, impacted by COVID-19 and uh, tourism exports for example, it counts for 7% uh, of all global trade in goods and services. It's an industry that has 1.7 uh, trillion US dollars, so it's huge. How can we uh, try to see while COVID continues what can happen? Um, looking at women in the tourism sector, often these jobs, there are no social networks behind it. If now they lose their job, what happens? Uh, so these kind of things really need to be taken into account when developing strategies and many countries now look together with hotel chains and, and others to see to try to find solutions, white papers are drafted and there's really this SDG 17 collaboration of joining forces and uh, for example, also uh, to go to the Caribbean, uh, Barbados is offering, for example, a hosting of a one year visa, come and work in Barbados, but you can only offer that, of course, if you are connected. So here again, the connection problem is really important and that's where this digital divide has to be reduced so that when pandemics like this happen, countries can find plan B, plan C and, and move ahead. So really, for me, it's so important that governments, businesses and communities work together that I would really like to stress and that the work needs to start now, because everything we do now has a triple effect on the next steps to undertake for uh, a post COVID or like Brian said, the great reset uh, world later on. Wonderful. Um, and, and with that, um, we are at our uh, end for the session on bridging the gap between the digital divide and making sure that nobody is left behind. I'd like to end in a quote by our Secretary General of UNCTA, Dr. Mekisa Ketui, the time to act is now. And these words cannot be truer um, in the present situation where we have uh, the pandemic, but at the same time have a rise in, 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 the, in the field of digital entrepreneurs. So thank you to my wonderful panelists for joining in from all over the world. Uh, thank you to our global viewers as well for all your questions um, and have a wonderful day ahead and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.